This presentation is brought to you by BenLowry.com. Good afternoon, Mark Stevens. How are you today? Uh, doing great. You got to edit out the part with the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No problem. Well, it's so nice to speak to you, Mark. And I know that our viewers are going to be thrilled to hear us speak today. We're really looking forward to hearing some of your stories and hearing about what you've been up to. So how have you been recently? Uh, great. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come on and uh, do a video with you. Sure, sure. Well, Mark, give us a little bit of an intro. Tell us a bit about how you got into all this law stuff. Where did it start for you and how long ago? Well, it started actually, and I did a video on my website, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to get to what we were just talking about. Uh, but it started, I guess, about 20 years ago. And I, I talk about this on, on the video delusions, so I go into a lot more detail there. And I, I sued the wrong guy. And I, it turned out that the building, he owned the building the court was located in. So we, you, probably, you, know, you can understand how that probably went. And, and that was a real smack upside the head. And, uh, and, and I moved out to Phoenix to go to school and just, you know, get away. And um, yeah, plus the sun came out. You know, I know you're there in, in Bristol. <laughs> and the sun, not, not, you can tell, you know. It's it's four o'clock in the or three o'clock in the afternoon here, and we we still got a, a bright sun in Phoenix, <clears throat> so that that was a, uh, a a factor too, and so I stumbled upon the Patriot community. I already figured that the courts were just for the people with the you know with, with the money. Um, I figured if they had the money, they could pay for it. They could get the facts and the, and evidence, and they could win the, the thing. And I stumbled upon the Patriot community and was investigating a lot of their claims, and started seeing a lot of the same BS with them that, you know, the judges and whatnot were doing. And so the more I investigated them, the more it all started to fall apart. And I guess what really did it for me was I was researching how to do, um, well, why judges have immunity, whatever they happen to do. I mean, they may go to jail, but they, they had absolute civil immunity from, from uh, any kind of lawsuit. It didn't matter what they were accused of while they had that robe on. Or over there, they have the you know the wig too. I <laughs> thought that was so funny looking. Uh, they had complete, absolute immunity, and you couldn't pierce it as far as I could research. I want to know why, so I started seeing these cases on judicial immunity and whatnot. And along the course, I started getting these cases, and these are in England too. So I, I don't want anyone in your audience, anyone thinking this is just the United States. It's not. Uh, it, it, even legally, it's not. Uh, these cases were so, showing that the government, from the police or whoever, had absolutely no legal duty whatsoever to protect anybody. And going through all the Patriot stuff, you can't go through all that without getting a lot of information about, you know, citizenship and capital C, it's lowercase, and all that stuff. And uh, it, it, <laughs> it turns out that there's no duty to protect anybody. And if the, if so this, I, I said, wait a minute, still in that mindset. Uh, research in the Patriots, if the only thing that makes you a citizen is a me membership in a body politic with a duty of allegiance in return for duty protection, that those are reciprocal obligations, one consideration for the other, and there's no duty to protect you, then it, uh, the whole thing collapsed from there, that there are no citizens, and if there are no citizens, there is no state, and there's no government, it's just a gang of killers, thieves, and liars. Hey. And, you know, so I started using this information in court. You know, coming at it from a standpoint that I look, I knew the prosecutor didn't represent anybody but himself, and now I knew how to go about bringing it out. All I had to do was start asking some questions, and so that's where it kind of came into. And, and the more experience I got into court, the in, in dealing with bureaucrats, the, the the more evidence I was able to get, I was able to see it with my own eyes and not just read about it in like Lysander Spooner's Constitution, No Authority, which is great. But nothing replaces when you actually go in there and do it. So that kind of set the ball in motion, and that led to the book. And uh, all right, oh, okay. Um, now, uh, Mark, currently you've got you've got this project thing uh, to do with traffic tickets or speeding tickets. Uh, would you tell us about that, please? Sure. It's actually for parking tickets, and I and, I, and the reason why I picked uh, parking tickets was because I didn't want any violent confrontations with the cops. Um, I didn't want anybody to, I wanted the risk to be as low as possible because a lot of what I've experienced in trying to get people engaged in, ish, you know, in, in standing up for themselves and actually living more free is the risk involved. That there is an inherent risk that when you are 
at being autonomous, at least to more of a degree than the average person is used to, there is always an inherent risk that someone out there is not going to like that, and they're going to take exception, and they're going to probably attack you. It doesn't mean, and by attack, it, I don't mean necessarily that it's going to be, uh, you know, agents at your door, uh, but you'll get, you know, you'll get things like this. You know, the, the they'll they'll send you letters. So that that to me is an attack. Mm. Anytime somebody's making a threat to take your property, that I, I take that to be an attack. And so uh, it was to minimize the risk. So people can be involved and do something and get some experience and see for themselves that when I say that traffic courts are, or like the IRS are just a bunch of criminals, they can see for themselves and not take my word for it. It's, it's not about me. But that's what my, my book is about, my experiences and things that I personally went through. And so the, 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 uh, and it's all, all can be verified. And uh, but the, with the traffic study, the parking tri ticket, People could do it on their own without, they don't need me to, to help them or call the show and say, hey, what about this? They can do it on their own, and for the most part, they are going to be on their own, and they can experience it themselves. But the risk is very, very low, so we, we use the parking tickets to oh, do that. You just the ticket and go. I see. So tell us about the strategy, the strategy of how somebody could go about defeating a parking ticket then. <sighs> This is and the beautiful thing about this, though, Ben. Too is that even though it is just a parking ticket, and you may look at it and say it's just a parking ticket. The strategy that you're talking about and and how you're challenging it, it's the same thing that you'd be doing if it was a tax evasion or you know drug possession or any other you know like say a speeding ticket. Say so it's all the same things. You know you're, you're typically not going to have a prosecutor, but you're still going to be hitting the same issues. So one of the things that they that they tell you is that you're entitled to a fair trial. I mean, over the, and it comes all from this this whole English thing that you know that you're entitled to a fair trial by a fair and impartial jury or judge. And, okay, and so knowing what we know that there is no state that they do business the barrel of a gun and, and all that that it's demonstrably false that there's a state and citizens. And knowing all this, we can go in and we can challenge this thing that you're entitled to a fair trial. So I like to keep it very simple so people understand. And, and Adventures of Lincoln kind of grew from why I was asking these three questions. I, mean, I had to explain so people you know, know. Because if you go into court and you don't know what you're talking about, they'll eat you alive. They just start screaming and you lose your train of thought. And, and whatnot. So uh, one of the strategies, of course, is to bring into conflict and put the judge in a double bind with his own statements. And I don't care where you are. It doesn't matter. We've done this in England with you guys, you know. And, and you get the same results. So the three questions are, am I entitled to a fair trial? Which they're going to say, yes. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> yeah. Can I get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest? No. No, of course not. I mean, come on, then I... <laughs> right. We asked the question. A lot of thought went into the question. It's just not something some you know, I'm, you know, some schmuck from Long Island. Oh, what's this answer? There's there's a process here. There's a reason why I'm asking that question. And I, now I've got him locked into a pretty bad spot. I'm entitled to a fair trial, but I can't get one if there's a conflict of interest. So the third question is, who do you represent here, sir? And you just you, you don't want to you don't want to blow. You just want to you just want to give him an opportunity to hang himself. Right. Right. Now, now, in England, we had a situation where they try to claim, well, yeah, but you could still get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest. That's not what you just said. You said I couldn't get, you see, that's why I'm asking the question the, the, way, the way I do. Yeah. Um, this is from a lot of time in court, a lot of time being immersed in, in their little system and going to court on a regular basis that you, you anticipate what they're going to say and you, you, you adapt to what you're doing and you take that into consideration. So that puts them in a pretty tough spot. What does he do? You've just demonstrated to everybody in the room that you can go in without a law degree and with three questions you can learn from some schmuck from Long Island. You can, make it, you can have a judge stop dead in his trap. What's he going to do from this point? I don't know. What what happens? I don't know. Well, see, you're an honest guy. <laughs> Someone, an honest person in that situation is really at a loss, like, uh, didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Even if they do, what are they going to do? Well, Mark, I can't see a judge answering those questions. Well, 
you know, one of the things I like to do is go in with an unsigned plea of guilty. Say, I'm just here to pay the fine. I don't understand what's going on. I have a few questions. Because the English system then, just like over here where they adapted it, adopted it from, you're entitled to be informed so that you can adequately defend yourself. And so I take advantage of that. So that's why I go in to plead guilty. And I'm able to ask these questions. So I put them in a really tough spot. But if they, if they weren't just scamming me, I couldn't do something like that. So uh, they more, most likely they start yelling and screaming. Right. Well, I just want to plead guilty and go home there. What's, what's the problem? You know, is, it, so the people behind you, you're, you're educating them. Like, so all of a sudden, he goes from being a calm, rational adult, seemingly, to screaming and coming with the right. <laughs> He's just... You know, it's like, we're always waiting, Ben. One of these days, when someone's going to report that the, the judge's nose started to bleed when we <laughs> asked those questions. <laughs> yeah. But the other side of it, though, is what if he does answer? Because a lot, sometimes they do. I'm not saying, most of the time they don't. They're shrewd enough, and they've got that stupid wig on for a reason. And they're, they're pretty smart. And they know not to answer the question, so they just, they, they just move on. So what they'll do is they won't tell you overtly they represent the state. They'll just represent you and enter a plea for you. But I'm trying to plead guilty. <laughs> Right. So a lot of times they do answer the state. Now what do you do? You, you're in a situation now where, and I've got audio of this, and, and so many people have replicated this, and they've called the show, and, and they were able to say, well, yeah, I asked the judge's question, and, and he said it represents the state. Or if I you, they, they have no choice. You can just show them the oath of office and, uh, that they're supposed to have. They don't actually need it to do this. So I see you represent the crown. Is that true? <laughs> so, paperwork says it's the crown versus mark. So it's kind of, kind of a bad spot from the VN. So when we do that, and it's very easy to do, it's just you have to keep in mind that you're dealing with a very violent individual. So you want to be very calm and, and unassuming as you can. Because you're putting on an act. You're, you're just acting. Right. And... Uh, so when they say that, a lot of this, like I call in the book Zen in the Art of Litigation, it's not a matter of making overt accusations. If you're going to make an accusation, don't do it in the form of a statement. Do it in the form of a question, because now it, it gives, that's your escape. I know it's a linguistic tool, a trick, whatever you want, but it helps. Right. And so you, 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 I'm able to say, like with the IRS, when they're flipping out, screaming at me, you're accusing me of a conflict of interest. No, sir, all I'm doing is asking you to explain to me how it's not. <laughs> right. I'm reserving my judgment until after you explain that. <laughs> and so it's the same with the judge. When he says he's representing the state or, with, let's say, in Canada or Australia or whatnot, and they say that they're representing the crown, don't accuse them of having a conflict of interest because they're just going to say, well, <laughs> we disagree. So well, you ask them, like the babe in the woods, I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> would, since you're representing the plaintiff, the state, wouldn't that be a conflict of interest? You know, and, and just just leave the ball in his court there. Now, more than likely, most of the time we do that when you're at that particular point, you've already demonstrated you can't get a fair trial. I mean, this guy's actually representing the party to the proceeding. Yeah. Call, I mean, it, it, you can't get a fair trial. I mean, it, it's that simple. So it usually isn't going to progress much further than that. And, and if it does, you've got grounds to, to change the judge and, and go back and file a motion to vacate. So that's one of the tactics that we use. Oh, I see. So uh, I'm not qu I don't quite understand, Mark. So how does it result? Uh, do, 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 does some of these tickets get thrown out or something? Or like, Well, you're a farmer, so I, I understand you. It's not going to be <laughs> as, as, <laughs> as quick. <laughs> Well, yes, it does result in that because right. you, you have the judge in a damn if you do, damn if you don't situation. You have him. See, this is what, what I think is very critical here. I am not looking for the judge to contradict the law. I mean, I could pull out code after code after code after code. Nobody cares what my opinion is of the law. No one gives a damn. I mean, no one cares. I mean, I accept it. I stopped crying about it a long time ago. I'm a, yeah. We move on. The judge, like I say in my workshops, the judge is the only acknowledged acknowledge legal expert in the room. Now, it doesn't do any good for you to fight that because you're not going to convince anybody. I, I, it doesn't care if you're a Harvard Law grad or you're teaching Harvard Law or Cambridge, for that matter. 
people's perception is what counts here, and their perception is he is the legal expert. What he says the law is, is it. Regardless of what the Constitution or the common law, what that judge says today is the law. Now, someone above him may disagree, and then it'll change. So we don't fight that. He's the only acknowledged legal expert in the room. And so he's in a very bad situation. He wants everybody else to just pay. He wants you out of there. So if you're asking him questions like this and he starts getting upset and he can't, let's say he can't answer, he refuses. Sir, I'm sitting here with an unsigned plea. I'm trying to be theatrical. I just want to plead guilty and go home. I just need to know who you represent here so that I can adequately defend my, and, you know, and understand the nature and cause of the charge and proceedings so I can just pay, pay your fine and go home. Now that's going to do a lot to, to question, have these people behind me question, why won't he answer the question? They don't understand that what, it, most people aren't going to understand what it means if he says, I represent the state. Right. It means nothing to them until I start explaining it. But the judge knows. They understand these principles. He knows it's a conflict of interest. Yeah. That's why they avoid it. And so I'll be the first to admit, I know there's, re there's merit to what I'm doing. That's why he's not going to answer the question, because there is merit, and it embarrasses him. Mm. But I know out of frustration, it may be just pure frustration why he's throwing it out. I'll take it. So, I mean, we've done it so many times. My interest is that if you're the client, you're left alone. Whether I get any credit for it, I don't, I don't care. I mean, <laughs> look behind me, obviously. I don't give a damn. But... The important thing is that you're left alone and that the judge has, has dropped it. And so they do drop. Oh, I see. Now, right. Well, look at the bind you've put him in. Yeah. You just said you're entitled to a fair trial, but you can't get one if there's a conflict of interest. Now you're asking him who he represents. Mm. Mm. Okay, so you're not, you're not making an accusation. All you're doing is you're taking advantage of rules he already knows without actually having to overtly say it. Mm. It's like when an attorney says to me when I asked him, and we have this posted on, on our website now, when I asked him if he had done any investigation and spoken with the agents who did the assessment prior to filing his lawsuit. Mm. Now, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm talking about Rule 11, which says you have to do that or it's sanctionable. Mm. Okay? But I'm assuming he's a lawyer and who understands that. I don't need to tell him and telegraph every single thing I'm doing. Let me get my admission first. So I'll ask him, without using the rule, sir, did you do any investigation prior to filing your lawsuit? Did you speak to the agents? Do you know their names? No, 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 I didn't do that. What's your point? That is. Mm, right. <laughs> it, 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 so um, I don't have to point out, and I sh and, and because they know what I'm doing when I get to that question. Right. If you go in and, and you have any pretense whatsoever that you just want to pay the fine and go home, that you don't understand what's going on, when you ask the judge who he represents, that facade is gone. He, he's got you... Right. And that's how he's going to be treating you now. And he's not going to be so open with his questions. And that's why a lot of IRS attorneys, and especially uh, IRS agents, my lawyer, they tell me, my lawyers have advised me not to speak to you and answer your questions. Mm. Mm. Just ask some questions. But I don't bring up and, and quote their laws, only extremely rarely. So if you listen to a lot of the calls with these tax agents, the only law I may actually cite is where they have to assign an agent. But that's got nothing to do with whether my client owes taxes or not. I don't get into that at all, and I don't need to. I don't need to call. I want to know what you, the agent, or you, the judge, what is your opinion, and then I'm going to use that. So like, you can ask it. And this is something people, they, they don't. It's incredible, you know, they're like, can you really do that? Yes, you could, you could walk into court, just like I do with the IRS, ask the judge what grounds are to get the ticket thrown out. Why not ask him? Right. If he is there, like, I'll ask the IRS that. There's a lack of witnesses and evidence, sufficient grounds to, 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 to right. throw this out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't have to, re the important thing is it's his opinion, and it's more important to get him to contradict his own opinion than what the law says. Right, right. Because that gets back to what I mentioned before. Their opinion on the law is what counts. Not yours, not mine, not anyone else involved. His opinion. So that's why I just get his opinion. Plus, I don't want to read the Internal Revenue Code if I don't have to. Right. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand now. I'm kind of new to this. This is really the 
but yeah that makes sense so you you put the ball in their court you make them answer you make them tell you what the rules are and then you kind of use it against them further down the line basically isn't it right and that's because and it, the important thing here is you, you got to know some of how they operate i mean you got to know you got to know your adversary hmm. and i've done enough time with these people to really understand how they're doing things and you have to, aside from how they typically, their, their, their process that you should know, which you don't have to read the law to know, aside from that, you need to get away, what I talk about is clearing the fictions. You, you, you have to look at the situation without the fictions. Because if you accept the fictions, they're, they're, they're going to trounce you. Hmm. Because what they'll, you know, they'll, they'll try to put everything back on you. Well, 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 wait a minute, what, what, evidence, what evidence do you have that you're not a taxpayer? And people will be like, right. right. So, if you don't have the fictions, and you don't, you just look at them as people. Well, wait a minute, I, I'm not the one who's making the accusation here. Why would I need evidence of anything? Right, I see. Hang on. Would you just clarify that for us a little bit, Mark? I, I, I kind of understand what you mean, and I kind of don't. When, when you say fiction, what do you mean? Well. Fiction, I'm talking about like an abstraction, something that only exists in, in someone's head. Hmm. And language is, at the same time, like they say in NLP, our greatest tool and also one of the our worst weapons. Because unlike animals, we're capable of abstract thought. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of people engage in abstract thought, mostly lawyers and bureaucrats, politicians. They believe it's real. So when I talk about a fiction, it's just something that's made up. It's, it, it doesn't exist outside the head. So they start talking to you that you're like you're a taxpayer. Well, you're, every taxpayer has to do this. If you accept that fiction, right. now you're stuck dealing with interpretation of the law. I which see you're gonna... what you mean. Yeah, so like the obligation to pay tax is a fiction, right? It's, it doesn't exist in reality. Is, is... No, right. It, right. It's, it's someone's opinion. Right. And you'll say, Mark... Whether your client is obligated to pay is an issue of fact. It's not an issue of opinion. And so if you accept that, this is what, what, what I am hoping to accomplish with the new book, and, and it, there is a new book, <laughs> I promise you, is people aren't questioning enough still. Even people who have read Adventures in Land, I'll get these emails and say, how do I respond to that? They said this. Well, ask them to prove it. Oh, <laughs> is it real? Can I? Yes, you could do it. Because they're accepting these fictions that these people are authorities. They're accepting a fiction that they're IRS agents instead of Eric Feynman. Or one today who's using a fiction for a name called KO Justice. I swear, that, that's his. I will get a screenshot for you and you can put that up here on the video. That is, he claims to be a. Yeah, as, but I don't accept the fiction that he's an IRS agent. Right. He's just the guy. And so when you don't buy into the fiction that you're a taxpayer, that uh, you're legally obligated, or that you're within the United States, because that's a fiction also, or that you're within the realm or, whatever, or in the shire, or whatever they're calling it there, or the province, mm -hmm. if you don't accept those fictions and you just look at them as people or the ground, that put, and, and then you put the burden on them to prove it, mm -hmm. what you're doing in a sense, in a very real sense what you're doing, and I explain this in workshops, you are forcing, and I don't like to use the word force, but you're making them actually think and you're showing that the words in their head have no physical referent. Hmm. And that's as clear as I, I mean, that's as clear as I can make it. And the questions that you're going through when you're doing this with them is you are showing that the words they use, taxpayer, province, have no physical referent. They don't mean anything outside their heads. So, example, when someone says to me, look, the, what, the, the income is taxable. It's an issue of fact. It's not an issue of law. It's, a, it's not an issue of opinion. It's a fact. And I'll say, great. Now, this is where most people are like, like oh, what do we do? This is so easy. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Now, walk me through this because I've got my checkbook out ready to cut you a check. What I need you to do is I need you to walk me through this and prove the income is taxable using just the facts and don't look at the law at all. Just walk me through that for a moment. And you just wait. 
because they'll invert they'll what they, but the loss <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so again you didn't accept the fictions and whatever they're putting forth whatever they're spewing the words remember it's words all words in her head if you just question them on it it will come out it is just in their head and so just just yesterday and I'll, and I'll get this on the website, I'll, I, okay, because I always take extensive, extensive notes when I'm doing it. I say, I can actually, these are my notes, you probably can't read it. Uh, but I take notes as I go. And so what this IRS agent told me, again, because I'm talking about facts. She told me, when I'm asking about facts to back up the opinion, you know, what's in their head, we don't know that. So I, she says, we can't know anything like that. We don't go around verifying this. I mean, that's what she said. Mm. Really? That's a strong position to come from. Yeah. <laughs> so really, all you're doing is you're, you're, you're looking at, at, at people as people and not accepting any of the fictions whatsoever and, and just questioning them and bringing out that their words have no physical referent. They think they do. They act as if it's real. They act like you're a taxpayer. Mm. And you have to accept that from their point of view but then meet them at that or that map of the world, and then just ask questions to bring out that it really doesn't refer to anything physical. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So it's like burden of proof, basically, is it? That's... it well, you're right. And what you mentioned before, the one who makes the accusation bears the burden of proof. Right. Right. This this is an adversarial process. This was not like the old Inquisition where they it was obviously they were there to kill you. Hmm. It was just a matter of. Well, well, oh, well, how would you like to be killed today? <laughs> uh, we, will we dismember you when we're done? Yeah. So it was overtly criminal. They weren't fooling anybody that it was not about justice. But here they, they put on an air, it is about justice. So right. it's adversarial. So the adversary has the burden of proof. Right. And who, the one who's making the accusation should have some basis. Now, whether they want to admit that or not, I don't care. Hmm. Because I can get them to admit it. So, well, let me ask you... Um, this is not an arbitrary opinion you're making against me, is it? <laughs> so what are they going to say? They can only say no. Oh, oh, so it's based on facts current within your knowledge. <laughs> right. I, no, I already know it's not. <laughs> but I get them to commit to that. Right. So I know, I know I, you know, people will say, well, what's your method? What's your method? Well, I don't accept the fictions and I ask questions. That's it. I mean, that's really... The whole model. I mean, there are specific other things that you want to do in dealing with the IRS, but that's the general model. Right. And if you follow that, then you, you're going to do a pretty good job of getting your objective if somebody is coming after you with a BS claim. And it doesn't have to be, you know, someone claiming to be from the government. And one of the most effective things that I've seen is, oh, oh, you've got a claim against me. Could you uh, give me a factual timeline and I'll cut you a check? I, you know... I want to know where, when, why, and how. Just give me a factual timeline, write it out. If you want to do one on a penalty of perjury, that's great. <laughs> and that's usually enough because you know that they're, 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 let me use an example. I don't have anything here. But if I say I can play guitar like Steve I, do you argue with me or do you just hand me a guitar? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yeah. That's all, that's all I suggest that people do. Use the scientific method and just ask questions. Right. Don't form your hypothesis or anything, you know, uh, unless you've done some investigation and it's based on something. I, I can form a certain conclusion based on prior experience. But I don't necessarily do that when I'm talking with the agent. I want the facts to speak before the opinion. Right. So I just say, you know, you know, because one thing I do when, when we do all this, you know, when, I, when I've got all the, and I've got all those phone calls that you can hear some of them on the website... I don't have to do like what the IRS does. So they'll say, if they ever say to me, what facts do you rely on that your client's not a taxpayer? I called you on Tuesday. <laughs> so I had this happen just the other day. Yeah. She said, uh, the tax agent, she said, um, I walked her through the process. She had the authority to abate. The grounds to do it abatement was a lack of witnesses and evidence. And so she said, you know, if you want me to abate, you're going to have to provide substantiation. I said, well, I've already done it, but I'll do it again. And so I don't just make an accusation. I have the facts to back it up. And I said, well, my substantiation is you told me you were authorized to do, to do an abatement. 
you you told me the grounds to justify an abatement with lack of witnesses and evidence. You told me there were no witnesses. You told me there was no evidence. You also told me you don't you've never had any contact with the agents who may have done these assessments. That's my substantiate. Those are facts. That just happened. We can document that. Mm. See, those are facts. See, that's something I think a lot of people do miss. We're absolutely certain, and I, I can prove beyond any doubt, beyond all doubt, no one's a taxpayer. I, can prove, I mean, it's, it's very easy. But i got to have more than just my accusation or just my statement. So when I file with the IRS or I'm doing with the IRS, I have my position that will be that there are no witnesses and evidence to show my client's a taxpayer and has taxable income. Well, what facts do I base that on? I had the phone call. I spoke to agent, you know, let's say I spoke to Ms. Clemens on Wednesday, November 9th. I then spoke to oh, Ms. Tabone, and I have badge numbers. Now, they may not be real. I don't know. But I had, these are my facts. So I've got my, I've got my opinion, my statement, my thesis, let's say, and then I have my supporting facts. And that's the way we do it. So like I mentioned to someone today, I could be wrong. There may be witnesses. There may be evidence. So if I'm incorrect as to that, what does the IRS then have to do? Produce them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's that simple. But we know because they've told us, and if you listen to the Kimberly Clark phone call, they won't disclose the name of the agent. So how can they possibly make a rational opposition to me beyond just their say-so? Mm. And we stick to the facts because they have to produce them. And they, all they have is their opinion. Well, Mark, you're wrong. I might be. But I've got these phone calls. I've got you. Now, if you think I'm wrong, are you able to testify? Are you qualified? <laughs> And, and so we keep sticking on the same point. I could be wrong. I've been known to be wrong. I accept it. Do you have any witnesses with personal first day knowledge? And we're right back on that. Right. I had to say to an agent just this morning, sir, if you think you have a qualified agent, then get him in touch with my client and I, and we will file that return forthwith. We will do it immediately. But we want to speak to the agent first. We'll save you the time for having to do the substitute for return. We'll do it for you. And, of course, he said, no, I can't do that. Okay. So you have no facts. You have no evidence. And you're right back to that. <laughs> right. wow. It's that simple. But from a legal standpoint, I want to point out, too, before I forget, when you do stick to the facts and you don't take legal opinions, such as, like, uh, my opinion, my position is based on what the witnesses from the IRS have told me. I mean, this is IRS agents telling me this, and lawyers. That's not me. It's not my opinion. They're telling me there's no witness. Uh, when I do it that way, that there's no witnesses and evidence on my client's a taxpayer, that is completely different than saying I'm not a taxpayer within the meaning of statute. I mean, it's a, it, one, is, this, one is fact, one is opinion. And they're, they're completely different. If you go on opinion then they can point out, well, Mark, the courts have ruled, and they can use stare decisis to settle an issue of law. But you cannot use stare decisis, well, you may not use stare decisis to settle an issue of fact, because every case is fact-specific. Mm. That's another reason why you can do that. So that, I don't care what the courts have said. Mm. So if I'm dealing with you, Ben, do you have a case of res judicata? And you're like, what the... What the? The res judicata is when a court and a jury has made a determination on the facts. Oh, right. Okay. Then it's over. But only for that year. So if it's taxes, it's only for 2005. If they did 2000, it has no application for 2009 because, hey, things change. So that's another reason why it's so important to stick to the facts. Oh, I because see. They, you know, they don't have that option of saying, well, yeah, in the case of... Uh, you know, Carrington versus Entick, uh, 1769, they did rule. It doesn't matter. Right. Right, because it doesn't but apply to the facts that you've got in that case. Right. Exactly. And if you don't have a factual dispute with the IRS, it's over. Oh, right. It is over. 
one of the things that you, so if you listen, if you listen to the last call of shame that we posted yesterday, the agent was on the impression, well, it's presumptively correct and good enough for summary judgment. Whoa, hello. <laughs> Which you can only get if there is only issues of law to settle. That's why I stick to just the facts. Hang on, I kind of, I kind of lost, I kind of, I didn't quite follow the. You, you, it's okay. Right. You're a pony. Yeah, we, we... Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just that last thirty seconds where you said, uh, you kind of lost me there. Okay, I'm sorry. When you get a, a summary judgment right. in a court, it is because, or because there are no issues of fact to be determined by a jury or trier fact. Okay. There's just issues of law. For the court to decide okay. so there's no trial right so they want to get you locked into a situation where there's no trial right because they've even told me just to, again today it's extraordinarily difficult for them to find out the, who the agents were that did the assessment on the substitute for return they have difficulty getting it right and 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 like i told ko justice today based on my experience almost a hundred percent of the agents have have admitted to not being qualified to say my client was a taxpayer or, or, or had taxable income. And I, I have proof, I have someone doing it under oath, which means nothing to me, but maybe so, you know, some other people it still does. You can go to my website and it's the uh, Maryland tax hearing. You can hear an agent admit that. She did some like seven, eight years worth of assessments and she's admitting under oath <laughs> in front of all her friends she wasn't qualified to do the assessment. But that's what she does for a living. So I, I, I just take their, their statements and use it against them. If I, if I say an agent's incompetent, it's because they told me. Right. Oh, I see. So we want, yeah, we want the dispute of facts. We, we don't want the facts to be settled in summary judgment. We want to, to win on the dispute of facts. Is, have I got that yes. right? Yeah. Yes. What you're doing, if you have a dispute of the facts, you're taking a huge monkey wrench and jamming it in the works and not allowing them to have summary judgment. Right. which is basically judgment without a trial, which means they don't have to give you any discovery, nothing, right. which, they're, which they're supposed to do. But, and I'm sure it's the same way over there, they don't want to disclose the name of the agents who are doing the assessments. So like K.O. Justice said to me, oh, wait, that's a frivolous argument, and if you're thinking that the agent who did the assessment is actually relevant to whether it's a, a valid assessment or not, that's frivolous. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me explain. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. So the analogy I use is you're saying basically that when a police officer writes a traffic ticket, you think it's valid even if you don't know the cop's name and he never shows up in court. <laughs> this is what you're telling me. And you think, you think that my reliance on it, so he tries to challenge me. What? Because I had initially said to him, if you think it's frivolous to challenge the evidentiary basis of an assessment. If you think that's frivolous, you need to cite a court case saying that because you you, you basically would have shut down the tax court. <laughs> there's no need for it. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're basically saying there's no need for evidence in a court case. That's right. You don't need courts, right. <laughs> right. So you need to cite that for me. Right. He says, no, what you need to do, Mark, is you need to cite to me why you think it's necessary to, to know the witness. And why the witness has their personal knowledge. I said, yeah, it's rule 602 of the evidence code, federal evidence code. And he says, oh, I think you're making that up. Well, okay. Right. So he says, I think, I think what you need to do is look at rule 601, which talks about, about documents. I said, no, I think you mean rule, six, rule 801. <laughs> oh, you're making it up. Okay. All right. Right. But wow. uh, yeah. They, they will always, and you'll see, when you challenge them or you get any of their apologists, because there's websites that, that uh, I'm not the focus of their website, but they all seem to be lawyers, and they think that I'm out of my mind because I focus on a witness. Focusing on the witness is insane. Really, I think I remember that in a movie once. Uh, pay no attention to the man behind that curtain. <laughs> yeah. Why? And ask yourself that, Ben. And everyone should ask themselves that. If they're confronted with it, it asks themselves and then asks an IRS. Why would the agent who did the assessment be irrelevant as to whether the assessment is valid or not? Especially when, if you ask them, Ben, like I asked this guy today, are you qualified to do assessments? No, I'm in collections. (laughs) 
you're in collections. You're not all, you're not qualified to do an assessment. You don't know who did the assessment. Yeah, I mean, they're testifying against themselves, aren't they? You know. Uh, well, if there weren't guns involved, my gosh, it would be laughable. Yeah. You yeah. know? I mean, seriously. You have people that are saying they swear that you're X, Y, Z. Right? We don't, let's not use the same word. This is what I mentioned in the book. Don't change the substance that the word refers to. We, we'll keep the referring exactly the same. We'll just use a different label. We'll say X, Y, Z. Look, Ben, you're an X, Y, Z. Who said that? Not important. <laughs> it's not relevant to whether it's correct or not. Are you qualified to say I'm X, Y, Z? No, of course not. <laughs> and yet, I'm the one that they're saying is crazy and just, I'm a loon and I don't understand and it's, it, it's crazy to look at the witness. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll accept that I'm crazy. Let's still examine what the witness has said. They can take me right out of the picture. It's nothing to do with me. So. Wow, it makes perfect sense, Mark. It's kind of it's, when you put it like that, it sort of seems simple, doesn't it? The logic, when the way you explain it like that. Well, when you when you get outside of legal land and you don't accept the fictions mm. and you're just talking in lay terms, it's just like I mentioned to um, I don't remember who. Oh, for the part of the parking study, parking ticket study, mm. I'm sending a letter to the judges and prosecutors, letting them know what's going on. And so, you know, I talk about how they have, governments have, uh, this is how you know there's no duty to protect you. Also, uh, there's no voluntary support. It's so coerced. And that's, you can prove that empirically. Um, it could be dangerous, but you can prove it. Uh, I mentioned that government has no voluntary support. All tax, you know, I said, you know, taxation is all coercion. And I said, you know, I, I prefer instead of using taxation, I like to use lay terms that, <laughs> that are more re accurately reflect reality. You take by force. Yeah, extortion. Yeah, you pay or you go to jail. And, you know, I had some, you know, and, you know, I had, I've actually had people contest that. We don't put anybody in jail. There's no coercion. I said, did you repeal section uh, 7203 or 7603? I mean, is tax evasion not a crime anymore? Is this what you're in the franchise tax board, it, did you repeal section 19701 of the revenue and taxation code without telling me? <laughs> really? Uh, it's not. It, it's no longer a, 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 a ten thousand dollar fine and a year in jail for not filing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I had Suzanne Small, the franchise tax board, actually tell me, without a hint of shame, that she's a lawyer. When the government orders you to do it, it's not threat, duress, and coercion. Really. <laughs> She says, the law, she, this is what she says to me, Mark, the law doesn't recognize it as, thre as a threat to rights and coercion. Really, can you, so, so let me ask you, I'll put you on the spot here. If somebody said to you the law doesn't recognize it as threat to rights and coercion, how would, what would you say to that? Me? You're, you're asking me now? Yeah, I'm asking. So someone said, yeah, how do you answer a statement like that? What do you, the, like, Ben, uh, uh, the law doesn't recognize it as threat to rest and coercion. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure, Mark. I don't know. I... You, you palmies in, in, in general, just, you're just, you, you're too, most people are just too stuck yeah. on them being an authority. Well, the law, see, the law hypnotizes you and like, well, okay, but I, can you cite that? That's what I said. Can you cite that? What do you mean by that? Well, she's saying to me, Mark, the law doesn't recognize it as threat to rest and coercion. Well, can you cite the law that says that? Oh, I see. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that? So when the BS comes out, yeah. bring it, put the burden, keep the burden on them. Oh, I see. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I, I'm with you now. Yeah, yeah. If you keep the burden on them, so if they throw you, I had the one lawyer say to me on the bench, uh, uh, Linda Scott, she says, uh, I am prepared to rule as a matter of law. Uh, objection, which law would that be? I am not going to discuss that with you. <laughs> right, right. If they have grounds, they'll give it to you. Right. And so it... it, it it, it all, don't take the fictions, don't accept the fictions, and challenge, 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 challenge. Don't, 
don't accept what they say. I had uh, the common one was somebody will file the motion to dismiss, like in the parking t- traffic stop. And they said, well, the judge, the judge said this doesn't apply here. What do I do? Well, why would you accept that as an answer? Right. So, so you could ask them, can you cite that? Could you say that? To well, them? Yeah, exactly. Can you cite me where the, uh, the legal exception is for this particular court? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and then if he doesn't give you anything, this is, see, turnabout is always fair play. A lot of what I do, I have taken from them, yeah. and I use it against them. It's just like I have a motion, uh, a, a, uh, a response from, uh, I, I, I took it out before, uh, I have a response from the county attorney in Keene, New Hampshire, where he says, oh, Mark Stevens doesn't have any standing. He suffered no legal injury. <laughs> really? And half the things you prosecute, there's no legal injury. So we take it and use it against them. <laughs> so... And that's one way to do it. And I have his motion, his response on my website. So if someone's in Keen or anyone, you, know, you can use a prosecutor's own, you know, paperwork against him. But when they say something like, oh, Mark, uh, that doesn't apply here. Do you have any legal basis for that whatsoever? No, no. I, I, oh, great. That's my defense. This ticket, this parking ticket doesn't apply. <laughs> oh, no, I have no defense. I have no support for that. <laughs> oh, oh. Am I the one making a mockery of the proceedings now? <laughs> because you know the contempt thing is going to be uh, right around the corner. Oh, oh, okay. But you just see if they're going to use something like, "Oh, that doesn't apply here," and they've got no basis in law whatsoever. Well, apparently, it's not a requirement in his court, now, is it? <laughs> right, right. Oh, so yeah. If, if yeah, so just use it against him. It's just like what what uh, John Webb did to avoid me being able to help somebody, he states what the law really is. What we've been saying for 10 years. But they ignore, it doesn't apply here. Now, I can't wait for someone, Ben, to take John Webb's own paperwork and attach it to the motion. Something he's prosecuting. (laughs) And have him explain it. (laughs) I'm really waiting for, I'm hoping someone's going to do that. Uh, But anytime they use something like that, it's, it's just like, and I know we're running out of time, I'm trying to get as much information as we can. Okay. Another way of doing it is, and this is one thing we're doing in the parking, the parking study. And if you're in England, you've got to make sure you can get to a magistrate's court if you're going to do it. So do some research if you're in England or in Australia. There are certain time, places where you can't take it to court. So don't, don't get a ticket in that you know, jurisdiction. But uh, one of the things that we are able to do is predict how the judge is going to respond, which is, which is a lot of fun. One of the things I'm doing here, Ben, is I'm letting these people know you have the guns, but you're really not that much in control. We can actually manipulate you. So I want to be able to show from my little chair here in Phoenix, the fortified compound, I can manipulate a judge in Brisbane or Melbourne or Suffolk. I can manipulate them to do certain things because I know their behavior. I can tell them in advance and they'll still do it. But one of the things we do is we manipulate the judge into denying cross-examination and not allowing a defense. Okay, because they're, they're frothing at the mouth. They declare the witness incompetent, which we could do with two questions. You move to ter- strike the testimony. He just realized, oh, this guy just played me. Dang it. He's furious. He doesn't allow a defense. But occasionally they do. So what I suggest that people do is if they do if this happens let me just cover a little more let me give the ba- the, the two questions to impeach the cop i've mentioned it before the, it, it, ha- every time doesn't mean it's going to get thrown out but it, it 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 will get the witness impeached every time the judge will say he's incompetent did you file a valid cause of action against me officer because the cop is writing the ticket right mm-hmm. did you file a valid cause of action and you'll say Yes. How many elements are in a valid cause of action? Now that's going to make the prosecutor, if there is one, the judge is going to come unglued. The witness does not qualify to testify. It's outside the skull, blah, 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 whatever. He's not allowing him to testify. He wrote the ticket. So I need this BS. He's only there to testify as to what he saw at the stop. and Bull. You have a right, substantive due process right. They'll tell you before you do the cross. 
that you have a right to challenge competency and credibility. So the idea that you can't challenge him on the ticket he wrote, absolute nonsense. Because he'll let, you ask, he'll let him answer that there was a valid cause of action because it makes it look good. Okay, so now you've got this. The witness is declared incompetent. You request that the testimony be stricken, including the charge on the ticket. You violated the statute, which is a legal conclusion, not a statement of fact. So the judge refuses to allow that. And he's, okay, just, that's it, cross-examination is over. Right? That's the thing. I love your response because, you have, when it, because I've talked about it on the show so much. People have to keep from laughing when it actually does happen, that the judge is, 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 is actually arrogant enough to, to fall for this every time. <laughs> right. I know the other alternative, Ben, is, that, well, they just won't allow cross-examination. Okay, you just save me some time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. So um, what we do is to show, because we know that they're supposed to allow cross-examination. We know that they're not supposed to take the testimony of a witness that's incompetent. They, we know they know that. But how do we get them to say it? If you object, ah, they don't care. That's a, a, my little Italian thing there. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'm sorry. So what you do, if they allow you a defense, this is great. But you got to be prepared for a serious emotional response. <laughs> you turn around and you call someone randomly out of the audience to testify on your behalf. <laughs> I, <laughs> see, you know what kind of response the judge or the magistrate's going to have, though. What's he going to do? He's going to say you can't do that or something. Why? Um, well, because they got the. Uh, no first-hand knowledge? I, I don't know. Not, there you go! Yeah, You're right. not qualified! You're not qualified, yeah, yeah. So you get the judge to say what you already knew was true. And he said, wait, he's not qualified to testify. Apparently that's not a principle that's... <laughs> right, right. Well, you let the cop testify and you said he was... See, and that's the thing. Right. Each time the judge is saying the witness is not qualified, not you. Yeah. Who's the only knowledge legal expert in the room? The judge. The judge. Right. So if the judge says the cop's incompetent, he's incompetent. Right. So if he's going to flip out and start screaming because your random participant is coming up and that they're not qualified, he's now telling you what the law is. He's contradicting himself. Who cares what the law says? It doesn't matter. He's contradicting himself. Right. So what's it going to be? Dan, if you do, Dan, if you don't. More than likely, he's going to say, that's it, we've heard enough of this. Get this guy out of here. Right. <laughs> Get him out. And, and it's just using his own testimony, his own opinions against him. Boy. We know they're BS. We know. Yeah. You can always use it against him. So even if you're a schmuck from Long Island, who I grew up in, actually Suffolk, I mentioned Suffolk, I grew up in Suffolk County. Oh, uh, really? Well, yeah, Suffolk County, Long Island, not... Oh, okay, right, I see. Yeah. No, I talk funny enough. <laughs> My gosh, that's incredible, Mark. Um, listen, um, tell us tell us about the new book. Uh, what's the difference from the new book and the old book? Tell us. Well, it's a lot more in depth. Okay. And yes, I'm using real experiences. Uh, everything's true. Everything can be verified. But the it's just the scope. I'm going so much more in depth where I purposely. Well, I still I, I stayed away from the psychological stuff in the first one. Um, I have an extensive part about it's, it's called government indicted, and what I'm doing is showing causation, how the principle or the idea of government itself, not any one individual man or woman, is the problem. It's the concept, and the concept builds a, a context, and, it, and it's within that context that all the fraud, all the trauma, all the damage and devastation takes place. So I show how, because of this concept and, and, the, and the structure that comes from it, the context, it can't be reformed. It can only be torn down. So what it does is it creates a hierarchy. So, of course, it's pyramid-shaped. And wherever you have a hierarchy, you've got bad news. I don't care if it's pr public or private, you know, government or... or wherever you have a hierarchy, you're going to have, you're, you're gonna have problems. It's not just exclusive to the government concept. The concept of hierarchy is itself very flawed and does not, uh, in my experience and what I, how I read these experiments and studies, it doesn't mesh very well with human sociology. It just doesn't. You, it, it's always a recipe for disaster. So I show 
causation on how the principle causes severe psychological trauma and damage and contributes to most crime. And then I also show how the concept contributes to severe uh, economic devastation, which we're going through right now, how Italy is, is on the, you know, the government uh, is on the brink of collapse. Hmm. Oh, I see. And, yeah, and it all, and, and I do have an explicit model at the end of the book. It is explicitly, at the last part of the book, is self-help which I didn't do in the first book. You could use adventures to do that. Many, many people have done that. This one's more explicit, and the model that I use and that I teach in workshops, I have it laid out. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that more people can take the model and learn from that and do it on their own right. instead of me having to be on the phone all day with the IRS. Right. And where can people get the book? Is it available on your website? It is, markstevens.net. Okay. Okay. And you can get these great shirts too now. So. Oh wow! Okay, merchandise. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very cool. Well, what I want to do with the shirts too, though, once uh, I sell some, I can get a few more. Is uh, people can wear them in court, where it says "No injury, no jurisdiction." Right. Right. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, because it's like it's thought provoking, isn't it? You know, it kind of it gets people thinking, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's what I'm hoping to accomplish with this book. What I didn't accomplish with Adventures was that. Um, and maybe I didn't really necessarily set out to do this, was that if people read the book, they would no longer believe in government in any shape or form, that they would come walk away from the book absolutely you know, horrified at uh, the, the government and, and, and wanting it abolished as soon as possible, as soon as society has evolved to a point where it can accept it, because they're not even close to that now. Uh, but Avengers didn't do that. There are people who read the book and just... You know, they glean all the court stuff and think it's great, but the underlying reasons why it's so effective, they don't want to hear, they, they, you know, they, they, they don't want to hear that. So with this one, um, my goal is when you read Government Indicted, you will be an unapologetic anarchist. Or, <laughs> or, or There's no advantage much about it. By the way, I, I saw that you spoke with Stefan Molyneux at the, uh, what was it called? The Libertarian Libertopia thing? Libertopia. Yeah, yeah. That, that there was some footage of that on the internet. We, I was watching that. So, yeah, we've got that also on my website now. Right, great. And also, you do consultations with people. So, if anybody's listening to this and they want to get in touch with you and they want some coaching or whatever, how how can they arrange that with you? Uh, just get in touch with me, Mark Stevens at mail dot com. Uh, you, you can also email me off the website. Uh, my my Skype, which a number of people have already called me that during this interview. Uh, it's uh, Frank Rizzo three, so it's pretty easy. And, and we also have the radio show that people, you know, call into the radio show. Uh, I'm not actually, 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 of today, I w I'm still doing consultations for the IRS, but I'm not actually going to be taking on any more new clients for my involvement. I'll, uh, if you want help in coaching consultation on resolving IRS things, I'm more, I'm, I'm here to help with that. But I'm not going to be taking new p clients and getting on the phone and dealing with the IRS. I'm only going to be doing that with the people I'm working with now. It just, it just takes up far too much of my time already, and I, it's why the book is so delayed. Sure, cool. But I'm happy to help, and we, you know, I also do you know, help with people with uh, drug possession, uh, basically victimless, anything that's victimless. Uh, I, I mean, we've been successful in hel helping people with that. Incredible. Um, I want to be respectful of your time, uh, so I don't want to keep you too long. But just quickly, uh, is there any? Have you got any upcoming speaking uh, dates that are coming up, like live events that people can come and see? Well, in January, I'm glad you asked. In January, we're looking to get back to Liber uh, to Cafe Libertalia. I'm going to be doing a workshop in San Diego, and uh, spoke to another musician yesterday. So after the workshop, now we're going to have an all-day workshop <laughs> dealing with. Bureaucrats, and we're going to have the script because I do have scripts available that have been very effective. People have been just take the script and have gotten tickets thrown out. Uh, but the script comes with it, and as does a, a motion template. So we're in California, we get the, the California demur. And after that, we're putting together a blues jam. So about an hour, hour and a half, we're going to. Because I know, I know you. We talked about that yesterday. You, you, uh, you're also a musician, so that's a very big part of my life. And if I can, if, if, you know, and I've been very lucky in doing this, I've, I've been able to meet people like you, you know, musicians. And like yesterday, I just met, you know, like I said, I met another musician yesterday, so I can put together things like this and, uh, and have sort of like spontaneous order where we could just get together with no rehearsal and just 
create on the fly, which is which is a ton of fun, which I look forward to. So we're looking to do that in um, in January. Oh, cool. Okay, so uh, I presume there'd be details of that on the website. People can check it out. Yeah, I, we uh, we I have uh, about Libertal uh, Cafe Libertalia up there. They uh, very agorist, uh, anarchist, or voluntarist oriented business there's no permission there's no licenses there's no sales tax so i highly recommend uh people uh, supporting jesse and donna in that and uh, and and um uh, and because more people need to do that they uh they, it takes guts to live that consistent with your principles because it, it there is an inherent risk it's just like an irs agent today saying to me well are you still at p.o box 3125 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all on the website. If you check it out, you can still get me. <laughs> I think it was another subtle little threat. But yeah, that'll be in January, so we're looking forward to that. And if somebody wants me to come out, as much as I hate the TSA, if we get enough people, uh, yeah, we can come out uh, wherever it happens to be and, and, and do that and maybe get a Blues Jam to boot. Cool. Oh, awesome, Mark. Listen, I, I, I want to be respectful of your time, so I won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much for talking to us. I've really enjoyed listening to you and i think everyone that listens to this is going to really appreciate you taking the time so thank you well i appreciate it thank you for the opportunity yeah yeah my pleasure all right then mark well i'll leave you for now and thanks again take care thank you all right bye-bye